I think that my headscarf absolutely contributes to my self-expression. Um, and I think that it not only contributes to my outward expression, but also my internal and my spiritual expression as well. And I think it's been uh, an extension of that ongoing internal dialogue that I've had about what modesty means and how that relates to the way that I choose to dress myself or the way that I choose to portray myself to the outside world. And I feel like modesty is a word that should be defined by every individual. The headscarf isn't really like a crown that I've reached some type of, you know, like spiritual level um, or like spiritual awakening, but it's more so a symbol that I strive to always be the best person that I want to be. I, I started wearing it when I was in junior high um, for personal reasons, but before that, I felt so alienated from society because of the Islamophobia I was enduring that I hid the fact that I was a Muslim. I heard my first racial slur when I was in fourth grade. One of my classmates taunted me by saying that my people throw rocks at tanks. And it was like right after 9-11. 9-11 happened when I was nine years old. Now, today, me wearing a headscarf is my rejection of the male gaze. It's a rejection of this like hypersexualization of women in our society. And it's also a defiance of Islamophobia. My family is from Jordan. I traveled to the Middle East for the first time when I was 13 years old. I was just struck by how hospitable everyone was, how nurturing and kind the people that I was meeting there were. And I saw with my own eyes what, what an Arab society or a Muslim society was like. And it made me realize just how different reality was from the way it was being portrayed on the news here. I decided that when I came back to the United States, I wanted to wear a headscarf. I felt so much pride in where I came from and what my background heritage was that, yes, I wanted people to know before they even knew what my name was, when they saw me, that I am of that people, that I'm a Muslim woman. What are the assumptions that you think people make about you when they first see you? That I'm voiceless, that somebody in my family must have forced me to put this on. There's no way I could have wanted to on my own. Is that true? Absolutely not. Um, Does your mom wear one? No. I remember I was in the passenger seat of my mom's car. She was driving me to school one morning and the cops pulled her over for like speeding or something like that. Um, and he was talking to my mom normally, like blah, blah, blah. And then he like bends over and takes a look inside and sees me sitting in the passenger seat wearing a headscarf. And then turns back to my mom and says, do you all speak English? Like after already having been in this conversation with her, they think that they can just like mistreat me and I will be like docile and helpless. Um, and I think that people uh, are shocked when they see that defiance. The most basic nature of the concept of hijab is that it's a personal relationship with God and no one else has any say in the matter besides the woman that's using it. And also the concept of hijab is not limited to women either. There is a definition of hijab for men as well. And men are expected to uphold hijab just as much as women. So we're not a monolith. And it's unfair for us because then it, it places this undue expectation on Muslim women, especially Muslim women that wear headscarves, to be perfect. And that we have to be this, these upstanding symbols of everything Islam represents when we're also human beings. Because there are so many people that like pick and choose the harshest possible interpretation of things and try to apply that today in ways that it just will not go. The extreme version of that is what you see you know, erupting in violence today, erupting in a lot of the oppression that we do see in some parts of the world that just is not founded within our religion, but people want it to be convenient. They want it to be convenient for their political agendas. They want it to be convenient for the status quo that benefits them or the privileges that benefit them in society. Um, and it's something that we have to push back against every day. And I think that those starting experiences are what led me to start MuslimGirl.com. Even teachers started coming up to me and asking me questions that they had about Islam or things that they were unsure about. And I figured that if people had these questions in my community, then I'm sure there are people out there that had these questions too. I still remember when Laura Bush made that iconic speech in 2001 where she said that Afghani women were oppressed and that we need to rescue them from this barbaric society in which they have no voice. And she used that as a pretense for us to go to war in one of the most devastating wars that completely destroyed a nation and most adversely impacted Afghani women and children than anyone else. If we are able as Muslim women to reclaim our narrative in the media and show like, no, we do have a voice. There are women on the ground overseas that are, you know, mobilizing. What, what would you say in doing all of this has been your biggest personal struggle? When I was on stage at the United States of Women's Summit, I remember making a comment while I was on stage that if I was a Muslim girl in another part of the world, one of the things that could have happened was that my voice would have been silenced by a drone. 
And that was a very sharp criticism of foreign of American foreign policy. And I remember before saying that in the back of my head, I said, should I bite my tongue and not say something like that? Because what if I'm never going to get invited to speak at the White House again? What if I'm not going to be, you know, my voice isn't going to be included in the conversation anymore? What is the point then? If you do have this platform and you're forced to bite your tongue, like that's the whole point. How has um, deciding to wear the hijab um, affected your love relationships? Well, I guess I can start off by saying that I've never been in a romantic relationship before. I've never had a boyfriend or anything. A huge part of that has been out of my own decision. When I do talk to guys, it is something that comes up a lot. It's like, oh, well, will I be able to see like what's under there? Can I touch? Can I do this? Um, or guys that will want to talk to me are like afraid to talk to me because I'd wear a headscarf and that means that I'm like completely off limits and things like that. Can you give me like an example? Um, that's the thing, again, because I'm so inexperienced, I, can't, I don't know if I can really speak to it too much. We're not looking for any specific yeah. answer, we just want to hear your story, like any yeah, specific instances. Story. Yeah, there's like this one guy that I was like, re I was like really like getting interested in, um, and he kind of just like started distancing, distancing himself or like, it really like wasn't going to like get anywhere. Um, and I remember like bringing it up with him and he said, oh, well, I just assumed because of like the headscarf thing that there wasn't going to be like any touching or like it wouldn't lead anywhere. So in that way, it's almost also like a cool protection over guys that want like a certain type of end goal. It forces that relationship to be about getting to know that person for who they are. For me personally, I have made like the commitment to not have sex with people before marriage. But I do acknowledge that obviously it's like different for, for everyone. Like I think that these types of decisions are so personal and they're not up for like public scrutiny. And I think that that's something also that we use religion to do. We use religion to create an excuse for ourselves to judge other people when like that's literally not the point. It's my personal belief that Islam is relative to the society in which it's practiced in. Almost the same way that we talk about the constitution, right? Like with the Supreme Court, it's like, is the constitution a living, breathing document? Or like Scalia said, is it a dead document? And just like deserves to be interpreted the way that it was intended to at the time. Like for me personally, I believe that the Quran is a living, breathing document. And it's one that is, is able to be malleable and shape shift throughout time and, and still be relevant. What would be the you that had not found this? And what is the you that has? Oh my God. Me without Islam would just be like such a hot mess. I think that I like my, my behavior would have been much more self-destructive without Islam. With my spirituality, it always keeps me centered. Like a bamboo tree, right? It's kind of like you can like sway with the breeze and like you can bend a little bit, but you'll never snap. And I think that's what my religion gives me. Can you name a most painful moment? This past December, um, this past winter, when Donald Trump said that we should have a ban on all Muslims from entering the country. Um, that was like honestly devastating because we felt compelled to publish a crisis safety manual for Muslim women on our website about simply how to survive in their own neighborhoods, their own hometowns, in the aftermath of this crazy like media frenzy. It is a direct attack on our livelihoods because it's not even about like, okay, we're gonna stop Muslims from entering this country that is like so opportune and, and where we belong and it's a melting pot or what, what have you, but think about what that does to us day to day. Have you ever felt like your life was being threatened like by someone to hate? As, as Muslim women, like especially for Muslim women that are publicly identifiable by what they wear on their head, like we feel a threat on our lives every time we step out of our house. I was um, like standing on the sidewalk, like somewhere in Manhattan, like talking to my colleagues from uh, a media network. And we're like discussing da da da, they're talking to me about their media company and one of them says, we have to like hit the reset button on everything within the company, like basically to just like start things over or whatever. And we noticed like as we were talking that there's like a white man like hovering near nearby like over our shoulders and stuff. And then when my friend said that, hit the reset button, this guy literally shoved himself into our little circle. And he was just like, I just want to make sure like by reset button, do you mean that you're trying to blow this entire place up right now? Like, do I have to worry about my life? Should I go get a cop? Should I tell them about what's happening? 
And I swear, like in that moment, like I saw my entire life flash before my eyes. Cause I was like, great. Like literally within a matter of minutes, my apartment is going to be ransacked. This guy's going to have some like terrorist accusations at a time where like Muslims don't even have due process in our country. You can get like shipped off to Guantanamo at any moment with this stuff. For Muslim millennials, we can't even use the slang term bomb anymore. We can't say like, yo, like literally when I was in college, I would stop myself from saying like, I bombed that exam because I was afraid that someone listening over my shoulder or something would take it the wrong way like it's that horrible it's that like dangerous for us yes i experience discrimination every single day like it, it sucks because our definition of terrorism is so limited and as we saw with like the orlando shooting only comes to define brown people like we we don't consider any crimes of terrorism committed by white people as terrorism what about like the fact that thousands of mass shootings have happened on our soil by people that look white, that are male, and we never call that terrorism. We don't even like profile that. So at the same time, but it's acceptable to, to profile me or like mistreat me because that's what you think terrorism is. We think, we perceive that only Muslims or only brown people are doing all the killing when really like we, we're neglecting all the other like violence that's happening around us. That's a result of so many societal ills that we're completely sweeping under, under the rug because it's much easier to blame some type of like abstract outside enemy than it is to really turn inward and address those issues that we have within ourselves. Like, oh, are you like, what do you think about like ISIS or whatever? It's like, how am I in any way connected to them? Like more so than you're connected to every other atrocity that's taken place in the third world or against the developing right. world throughout history, like since the start of time. But it's like, it's a double standard. When do you feel um, the most vulnerable? feel the most vulnerable when I'm opening myself up to someone, I guess. When I let people into feelings of like pain or hurt that I experience, that's what makes me feel like the most uncomfortable. Um, possibly because when you're in this kind of like field of work, you have to put up like that like face all the time, like a poker face and like not let this get to you. Um, and you're just like dealing with so much trauma and tragedy all the time that you kind of like are forced to um, build up that wall so that you can like survive it and I can't like hold back the tears anymore or um, I need someone to like talk to you to like get it out that's when it's the most vulnerable what would you tell your, your 12 year old self that she's beautiful in a way that society can't understand nor wants to understand nor is capable of understanding yet that she's going to come into her own and that she is going to take whatever pain she's feeling and and do something with it that's going to stop other little girls other 12 year old little girls from feeling the way that she did at that time that was really so beautiful and amazing how do you feel um exposed <laughs> I feel really exposed right now, and not even physically. <laughs>